Molly gave a superb class in radiochemistry, and you had to, you had to blow your own detector. Yeah, you had to blow the glass for your own detectors. I feel around with that a little. Same time that this one was taken. Or was it the uh, yeah? <clears throat> I wonder if anybody got into health physics knowing such a, such a thing even existed at the time they started. What, as risk? No, as... Oh, oh as health physics? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I certainly did. I Sur had surgery. Oh, I uh, AB canal, complete AB canal surgery. I was wondering where you're... Uh, are. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sidney Porter representing the Health Physics Society History Committee, and it's my distinct pleasure to be able to interview a colleague, an old friend, uh, a superb health physicist, by the way, who is a, uh, an early member of the Health Physics Society and uh, has been elected a fellow of the society and also has, has taken his uh, board exams and is a board certified health physicist, better known as a certified health physicist. Now, Bill, you want to tell us about your early days and how you got into health physics? And I believe you have some pictures to show us of you as a young man. Well, I have a few pictures. Actually, this whole thing is a story about, it's sort of like a thermalization of a neutron or an accidental path of some way. I was born in western Pennsylvania, Uniontown, and grew up in, mostly in Manesson, Pennsylvania, and in Florida, Hollywood, Florida. Uh, graduated from Manesson High School. Uh, I have one early picture of me. I don't have very many pictures around. I usually uh, don't keep them out for obvious reasons. Uh, went to Penn State uh, with an NROTC scholarship. Started out in chemical engineering. Decided, or had it partially decided for me that I didn't want to be a chemical engineer and shifted to uh, liberal arts after two years. Graduated uh, in 1957 with a uh, I had a science major, history minor, a math minor, and a political science minor, but they wrapped it up and called it Arts and Letters. Went off to the Navy with an Arts and Letters degree. I hit the destroyer by the name of the USS Sigourney in the summer of 1957 and found myself assigned to the engineering department. This sort of surprised me because I thought I was going to be in the operations department. It seemed that some uh, yeoman, uh, secretary of the Navy office at the Penn State, had not bothered to change my records from engineering to liberal arts, so I wound up in engineering. First job was as damage control assistant, which involves nuclear, biological, and chemical defense work. So they sent me up to uh, school at the uh, Navy Yard in Philadelphia. I took six weeks of, of study on uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical defense. After another year or two on the destroyer, I was assigned to uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, where the Navy has its school in uh, nuclear, biological, chemical defense for shore installations. At that time, it was there. I don't think it exists anymore. In fact, I don't think I don't think Fort McClellan has that school anymore. But that's sort of irrelevant. They gave me some time to read, and I decided I liked the radiation protection issues and uh, tried to move that way in the Navy. I was informed that. There wasn't any way I could do that except to revert back to being an ensign. At that time, I was a lieutenant. I had <coughs> a wife and two children, and uh, didn't figure I could afford being an ensign again, so I wound up leaving the Navy. I had to go serve on another ship before I could get out. I was on the Okinawa. I had the pleasure of uh, being a plank owner on that ship. It's a helicopter carrier. Uh, wound up being involved in the Cuban missile issue. That uh, when President Kennedy gave his uh, famous speech, I was sitting off the uh, about 90 miles from Guantanamo, south of Haiti. We were ready to go in to take out any of the uh, U.S. people that, <coughs> you know, that if they wanted out of Guantanamo, if things got out of hand. Uh, I left that ship in May of 1963. Went to the University of Rochester. And what made you go to the University of Rochester? Well, I'd applied to most of the other schools, and uh, they felt with some justification that my math background probably wasn't strong enough, and uh, 
my overall undergraduate grades weren't very good. I should point out I was valedictorian of a high school of 200 people, but when I went to Penn State, I decided uh, other things were more interesting. I, um, I was working three jobs. Uh, I was making six or seven dates a week, you know, with a little. But it took me a couple years to get over the, over the freedom issue, uh, getting away. But at any rate, uh, the University of Rochester was the only one that offered me admission. Dr. Stannard was kind enough to, to uh, allow me to come there, provided a, uh, initially it was going to be a tuition uh, fellowship. But when we finally got there, I don't think he ever thought we'd come without any, any more of a, you know, support. But my wife was a, a registered nurse, an operating room nurse, and she figured, well, I can support us while he goes to school. So we went up there. They found a, a fellowship for me there. Uh, did the their what they called a Plan B scholarship at that point, uh, where a degree where you don't do a thesis, you just uh, take the coursework and and do a pseudo study project. I did a a project with solid state of symmetry, which uh, involved both uh, no film badges and uh, TL, early TLDs, the powder type TLDs, uh, radio phosphorus, radio phosphorescent. Yeah, elimination of seminars, the kind of, kind of service used in the DT60 personnel to seminars, things like that. And uh, well, how was Noel? Uh uh, how did Newell uh, get you through this program? Uh, to, to, uh, to tell me about his influence. Well, the mere fact that he allowed me in there in the first place, <laughs> he could be entirely justified in not doing that. That was, and uh, he was my initial advisor. When I got working on the solid state things, I went to uh, working with Herb Mirmagen, who was the professor of health physics and the health physicist for the department. He was a one of the few full professors that I've known, Ken Miller here at the Hershey Medical Center being another, who got to be a full professor without having a doctoral degree. That his degree was from Germany someplace, I don't remember anymore. But at any rate, I left Rochester, uh, went to work for Applied Health Physics, a firm in, consulting firm in Pittsburgh, uh, run by Bob Gallagher. Worked with them for about eight months. Most of the time, then it was uh, most of that work was in connection with uh, TLD dosimetry, film badges, and a few other things. I got involved with surveys. And, excuse me, I dry out real quick. I would. I did a lot of different things there. You know, nuclear laundry surveys of norm facilities and such things. I think that was probably responsible together with the, uh, the big course that the Baltimore Washington chapter put on, uh, I left, just to go back a step, when I left Applied Health Physics, I went to the Public Health Service. In, what, uh, Bobby, why did you leave Applied Health Physics? Uh, the company was having financial problems. We didn't have enough work to keep us, you know, fully and gainfully employed. They couldn't really afford the you know, number of people they had. My immediate supervisor at Rochester was Bob Augustine. Dr. Augustine had been in the public health service uh, before he came to Applied Health Physics as technical director. He uh, made some contacts in the uh, public health service. One thing led to another, and I was commissioned in the public health service in 1966. My Navy, six years of Navy time counted and it worked out very well. I was able to count that uh, service time. That's good. Now, now, when did you take? Uh, you know, did, did you take a ABHP prep course? I took the 32-week course. I think it was at the time that the Baltimore Washington chapter gave, and that would have been in uh, winter of 66, 67. I took the exam in 67. Was certified in 68. You must have taken the second or third year for given that. Mm, might have been. I think my number was. You know, Mike, Mike, Mike Turpelak and I eight. put it together in 66. Huh. I didn't realize that. I knew Turpelak was involved with it. I really didn't know. Yeah, well, he probably, I wrote it, he published it. Mm -hmm. That's how it went. But anyway, the thing is that, that, you, that, that you took it and you passed the first time around. Right. Well, you're a very bright person. You know, most people don't. Not back in those days. Well, I happen to have, a, to a certain degree, a right, reasonably good short-term memory. 
uh, I was able to pack a lot of stuff in there and remember enough of it. <laughs> I've made a very, very strong point of making sure I had enough recertification credits every year, every time since. And I wouldn't have to go back and take all that again because I'm not really up to it's much tougher learning, than learning, learning that. Yeah, I know it's tougher and it's in two different sections and all that sort of thing. I was working for uh, in environmental radiation for the Public Health Service. Bob, Gav Bob Augustine had come back to the PHS and wound up being my immediate supervisor. And it was one of those situations where I'd come up with an idea and uh, I'd pass it up the line. I said, well, let's let Dr. So-and-so take a look at it and see what he thinks. And I thought, I was thinking, gee, why don't I take a look at it? Why am, why am I not the person taking a look at it? So I put it, put in the code for off the, uh, out of the service training for the Public Health Service. Um, they told me I better do it right away because it'll be, you know, several years before they'll take you. I was, again, very fortunate. They sent me the, back to Rochester for my doctorate the first time I applied. Wow. And I went back there. Uh, and that was when? What year did you go back to Rochester, roughly? Uh, it would have been 1968. I went to Rochester. I was then doing, working on a PhD in radiation biology. So I sort of, it sort of involved from health physics into radiation biology, and then, as we'll see later, back into into health physics. I. Uh, well, they both are intertwined. I know they're, they're heavily, heavily intertwined. Uh, I was more deeply into the biological end of, of radiation for a long time than I was in the, in the physical end of it. But I went to Rochester in 68. I stayed there to 71, finished up all the necessary courses. what was your major thesis? Uh, major thesis was in the uh, effects and characterization and effects of uh, Krypton-85 on animals, which I did uh, a lot of basic things like solubilities and transfer coefficients and uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, how the uh, gas was uptake, was taken up into animals and then desaturated from them. We did some uh, LD50 studies with it by inhalation. That was done after I left Rochester, but before I got the degree. I remember you gave one of the major papers in the Noble Gas Symposium. I don't remember exactly mm -hmm. when that was, late 60s maybe? Mm -hmm. so it was the uh, Noble Gas Symposium in Las Vegas. And uh, that would have been 71 or 2. Because at that time all the nuclear power plants in the country were really anxious to learn how to measure radio noble mm -hmm. gases better. And <clears throat> your paper was one of the ones that kept coming up when, when we did literature searches. Uh, the literature. That's why I was so anxious to go to that meeting, Bill, so I could hear your paper, believe it or not. <laughs> well, I'm flattered. Uh, the initial part of that Krypton study was an aggregation of all the literature that I could find on the subject. And uh, it wound up, my thesis was in three separate pieces or four separate pieces. The first piece was you know, when it was finally published, the first package was the, uh, the literature survey, and then there was the uh, pharmacokinetics, and then there was the uh, uh, lethality. So it was, you know, put in several different pieces. But, uh, that, that paper got translated into Japanese. I was very, very flattered as a, what was it, uh, Krupitan, I think they had, that was the, how they called Krypton in the title. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what happened then? Well, the thing is that um, you, uh, you, your, your PhD was a, uh, thesis was accepted, the work right. that you did, and you, and you got your actual PhD? In 1974. I did the last, the last couple of years I was uh, working in Absentia. I had all the coursework done and the, uh, you know, the qualifying exams done. The service really would have pre preferred not to pay for me to be there full time, so I was transferred to the the uh, laboratory at, uh, in uh, Montgomery. And what were you doing in the Montgomery laboratory? Tell me about that. One. Well, we, that's real health physics. Well, it was still Krypton research. We set up a laboratory there where we could do both the internal. Was Abe Coleman there at that point? I don't think so. I don't. I, I know they knew Abe, but I don't think he was there at the time. 
Charlie Porter had just become the uh, director of Lab Arts. I was working in the uh, bio effects branch, I think it was called, with uh, Jim Everts, who's doing work on uh, with uh, microwaves on Chinese hamster cells, uh, actually cheek patch on Chinese hamsters, and I set up my Krypton project there. Uh, perhaps you may remember the uh, Public Health Service had developed a system for taking radionuclides out of milk in which they used huge refrigerated tanks. These were 18 feet long by 8 feet in diameter. And they succeeded in taking all the radioactive material out of milk, and you had a white chalky material that was done uh, that looked like milk, but no one really could recognize it as milk, so that sort of you know, went away, and they had these big tanks sitting there, and I said, well, I can get an infinite cloud for Krypton Beta, one of these tanks. So we put airlocks in the one end of them, put a, a vinyl lining so we wouldn't have a bunch of brimster along from the, uh, the modern en energy beta from the krypton banging into the stainless steel walls, put a bicycle chain support system down the middle of the, uh, of the uh, tank. tank, and uh, the animals were, were uh, exposed in wire baskets that were hanging from that chamber. They had about 99% of, of an infinite cloud dose. So we did uh, lethality studies on guinea pigs, rats, and Chinese hamsters. Yeah, it's too bad University of Michigan did all the calibrations, all the early Nobel mm -hmm. gas calibration things had had too small a chamber for krypton Yeah, Jim, Jim Martin got me got me working on some of this stuff. Actually, one of the earliest chambers that I used took uh, was still in Rockville before I went to Rochester. Was a weather balloon. Mm. We were calibrating dosimeters to Krypton, uh, and uh, we blew up a weather balloon to about oh, 12 feet or so in diameter and put the, the uh, PLDs into the middle for a while. One of the things we found out is that Krypton, along with other noble gases, goes through latex balloons very rapidly. So you weren't, we weren't able to keep it in too well. In fact, I did an experiment all after that where I put the Krypton in the put two balloons concentrically, put krypton in the inner balloon and measured the air that was in the outer balloon in it. We could start seeing krypton in the outer balloon within an hour or two of the... Yeah, um, heavy mylar is, is a much better... Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but it turns out even after a while, yeah, heavy mylar, you know, after a week or two, the mm -hmm. noble gas starts to make it, make it through there. And believe it or not, in the, uh, in the work that's been done in radon, measurements over the last 20 years or so, they've had to give up every single plastic known to man. Uh, they've tried all these space-age plastics, <laughs> and after a week or two, they all seem to leak a little. So guess what? They're back to thin stainless steel, <laughs> where we started from all those years ago. And I hate to think the tens of thousands of dollars that these people have spent in this. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot to mention when we went by it, while, while I was in Rockville, uh, we developed, we being Henry Reck and uh, Roger Schneider, and I developed a uh, TLD system that used uh, cleave lithium fluoride crystals of about a uh, centimeter squared, about a millimeter thick, and did individual photon counting of the photons being emitted from the TLD. And we were able to get a system that, uh, as I recall, gave about 10,000 counts for every milligram of exposure. Mm. And Didn't we used those on, uh, they were used on uh, studies that were done as part of the next study, you know, where they, no, the next was that? that study, Roughly. this was 67, thereabouts. We packaged some of them up and sent them to Corral along well, with other did, did you publish that? I don't remember seeing yeah, that. Yeah, it was, it was published. I wasn't the first author on it, but it was published. Because the Royal Naval College in London, Greenwich, uh, England, uh, redid that work. <laughs> they redid the whole thing, and uh, when TMI came along, they very proudly sent me these 30 or 40 thin cleaved crystals, mm -hmm. one on top of another, as as a low range beta dosimeter <laughs> that quote they had developed, not knowing mm -hmm. that you had done it. Uh, it sounds like 15 years earlier. We used them around um, West Valley when. Uh, 
one of the public health service people was up there doing uh, environmental monitoring. Did you do there. any beta response there? Yeah. To those? Because th that's what they couldn't find, the Brits couldn't find in the literature. Well, that, we we a, used a, it was a two, uh, like a two crystal package. One of them had maybe, uh, I don't really remember exactly, three sixteenths or so of plastic on top of the crystal and the other one had a, a mylar, an uh, aluminized mylar uh, over it. So we were able to get both. And that's what we were calibrating in that big balloon. Mm. They also went to Kerala, you know, where they wanted to get measurements on the, uh, the fishermen mm -hmm. with the high uh, uh, levels of uh, norm in, in, in the uh, Kerala area. And they went down to the Morro de Ferro in, in uh, Brazil. Uh, one of uh, Earl Eisenbud's graduate students had him down there. Joyce? I was a man. What's her name? Bob Jeez. something or other. I can't remember. Oh, 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 man. Okay. Well, well, another gal at Rio de Janeiro that's the half chief health physicist for the for the country, mm -hmm. and she and she, and she is a graduate student at Rennes. Joyce Feldman. That's her name. Oh, yeah. I know Joyce. But in but in but in any case, so so these these did have a practical use, and uh, oh, yeah. other than than what you were using them for, they they were taken around and using them in. The, Public Health Service had these uh, men's and women's underwear where they had little pockets to put the dosimeters into, and selected patients wore them when they were having their examinations done. Well, you know, for the next program? Yeah. One now, the earliest one. tell me about the radiation surveillance network. When did you start working on that? That, that, that was that along was, the way here. Yeah, that was while I was in Rockville. Um, now, how early was that? That was 67. 66, 67. The two years I was in Rockville, I worked with the, the uh, uh, surveillance network, uh, which was 80 some air sampling stations and air and precipitation stations. Uh, and located just around the U.S., correct? Uh, no, not entirely. There were a number of them in South America, the Pan American Health okay. Organization. Okay, I didn't know that you all ran those. Yeah. I, I know that Hassel ran a few of those. Yeah, we ran them. Uh, it was when I got there. They were using the, uh, you know, the Staplex sampler, the high wall uh, vacuum cleaner motor, with a sampling head. Darn good motor. And the, and the biggest cost was uh, replacing vacuum cleaners. I had one guy that did nothing but ship out vacuum cleaners, motors, you know, to replace them. They were still about the best motor you could buy. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, we changed to a uh, low bar type positive displacement pump, a roots conical pump at that time. And those pumps went on, and they were in use for six to ten years. In fact, uh, I came to the state way down the line in this story in 1992 when there was still one in, in use on the roof of the building mm -hmm. there. Uh, and we also stopped using the rotometers. We were using a pressure drop across an orifice on it sharp orifice on a disc right. to measure the flow of the... Yeah, uh, constant flow of orifice. Yeah. yeah. You know, th that, that was, a, that was a, an improvement that I think everybody went to right away as soon as they saw that. Yeah. Made, I, 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 made, I made the first one out of uh, one of the Staplex rings, a piece of pipe, four-inch pipe, and a four-inch uh, four planchette, and used a carriage punch to punch the hole well, in the center of it. When did you do that? That was in that same time period. Well, that, that was a productive time period. Now, now those 80 uh, fallout monitoring stations were very important oh, yeah. because they, they told the world what was going on as far as fallout was, mm -hmm. was concerned. And that data, as I remember, was published in a unique publication that we're all sorry doesn't still exist. Radiation you want, you want, data, data, health, and reports. Right, health, data, and reports. You, you, you want to say a little bit about that? Because I know you published in that continually, didn't you? Yeah, we uh, published data. all the data we collected in that along with all the data collected by the states that uh, submitted it. I don't know exactly when it stopped publishing. I have in my basement from probably 63 through 66 or 7, something like that. It was a very good, very useful oh, publication. Was, I think 68 to 69 is when it finally stopped. Very, very mm -hmm. sadly. I mean, it was a sad thing. You know, the government makes these well, unilateral decisions w without really talking to the scientists to find out how it's going to affect things. I lost, I lost. Since then, you have a heck of a time getting this data. You have to go to yeah. 10 different places and you don't have it all. The Public Health Service, or not, EPA, 
now publishes something called Radiation Health Data or something like that that is put out on a quarterly basis, supposedly. It's also supposedly on their website, but the last I looked, it was some years behind. I bugged them a little bit about it. And they don't have most of, that, uh, most of the hassle reports. No. Which are, in this day and age, probably the most important reports in that area that are being put out. Mm -hmm. And certainly, some, certainly the most comprehensive. I wondered a lot when the uh, Public Health Service, or whether it was the uh, cancer folks, uh, were doing the uh, the radioiodine study several years ago when they were trying to figure out how much radioiodine wound up where. I just saw no mention of any of the Public Health Service data or the Radiation Surveillance Network data there. Right, and in the early days all the hassle data went in there too. Mm -hmm. And all the hassle reports were referenced in there. Mm -hmm. And now they don't seem to be referenced anywhere, which is kind of sad. That, so it's much tougher for uh, environmental scientists in the health physics field to get today to, the, to get there. To get the information. Because they don't have that and and it look, it seemed to me that you were very instrumental in, in making sure that that uh, that that um, that those reports just get, came out, right? My, now my first acquaintanceship with uh, computers occurred then, when we shifted over our data handling onto uh, what was it, an IBM 1620 computer? It was about as big as this conference room and had 20,000 byte capacity, and the data were being put in by uh, key punch. And one of the things I did then was put it <coughs> on to optical scan, so the data could be scanned and done faster. Of course, now you can put something that size in your wristwatch. So, so um, that was very valuable experience, though, wasn't it? Working, Definitely. Well, work, working with all that fallout data from from around the world, actually. And it was a lot of political hassles involved with it. The Pan American Health Network, particularly. Uh, how so? Well, in the sense that I remember at one time I managed to figure to match spectra that were taken in Guam and taken in South America from the same weapon system. Well, Guam's north of the equator. And I, I thought it was interesting that we were able to, that was a French test as I recall, be able to see the, uh, the same spectrum you know, from, the, from that test in different places. I went to try to write it up and I was uh, I informed that I would have to have the written consent of every participating country before anything could be published on it. So yeah, it, was, okay. it was never specifically published. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> it really is. Well, um, you moved on and, and your Krypton 85 studies took a, took a lot of years actually, didn't right. it? Right. I was working on them from, started in uh, 68 at Rochester, 69, some of the earliest stuff, and uh, closed out in 79, early 80. And the only reason it was closed out was the government was withdrawing support. I had a lot of, a lot of useful things going on at the time. Um, primarily uh, things I was working on toward the end were uh, induction of skin tumors in different species you know, from whole body exposure. And the uh, results were radically different between guinea pigs and, and rats. Uh, Did you do pigs? No. I, I, had no <coughs> hang, I had no way of hanging a pig in my chamber. It was a little, a little large. Uh, well, miniature pigs were often used because, the, yeah. because of the similarity of human skin. Yeah, but I had a, I had a gore about it. One by I, I knew about that at the time. In fact, it was a... Uh, what was his name, Philip, from uh, New York, who was doing skin studies with mice. Uh, very well known. My mind will bring it up sooner or later. Uh, one of the primary things I think that he discovered was the tumor incidence from beta dose was due to, was proportional to the dose at the level of the root of the hair, the hair follicle, rather than someplace else. It wasn't surface dose. It was depth dose, and I think that was something like oh, 75 microns down, something like that. Yeah, it took us uh, another 15 years to rediscover that uh, mm -hmm. in, the, but, in the NCRP publications. But the rats developed tumors they're very much along that line. Guinea pigs, I couldn't get to develop any external tumors at all. 40,000 rats for a surface dose, and they didn't develop any tumors. Some, a few of them died. Some dried desquamation, they lost hair, lost some weight, most of them just kept on trucking. 
Mm, that's Some of them a few years down, or several years down the line, developed the B cell uh, leukemia, uh, which was really odd because uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is not normally thought of as being induced by radiation. We tried to follow it up by another uh, strain of animals. Those were done with uh, Duncan Hartley pigs. Uh, we tried to do the uh, strain two pigs that the uh, cancer center had. Didn't, didn't get it much of anything. Three years into the study, it was killed because of lack of money. Mm. So we never did see the end of anything. You know, much on that. But anyhow, those, those rats uh, developed, I saw as many as 12 or 14 tumors on a single animal. Mm. Uh, we used the protocol that we just left it go. Some people used a protocol that they took them off as they developed. We wanted to see what developed out of them. Got some humongous uh, sized tumors on them. They were, what are the keratoacanthinomas that ultimately went to a malignant tumor. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But I had tumors as big as 300 grams taken off a 300 gram rat. Ooh. <laughs> it was. Now, what led you in uh, 1980 to go uh, to become the associate director of the experimental biology division uh, at EPA? Well, that didn't last very long. As Dan K, there are two left handed, same aged, radiation biologists in the world from the University of Rochester. Dan Cahill was one on the other. And I sort of followed Dan Cahill around for uh, a while. He moved up to be the uh, division director. I moved in to be the branch chief behind him. And when the fellow that was up there with him as, as the uh, vice deputy chief uh, retired, he asked me to come up there. Which I did. One of the, one of the reasons that uh, I did this was that um, the money was disappearing. EPA was not sponsoring ionizing radiation research. I was living on an interagency uh, agreement with the Department of uh, Energy. They were getting to the point that the only people they were going to, to cover were people that were working in the national laboratory. So I sort of wound up having to do administrative work involving radiation rather than doing direct research work, which sort of, excuse me, there's Mr. Ken and Mr. Drewski. We're, we're still alive here, gentlemen, so we're yeah, here. we're not the time here. Keep going here. Well, well, well tell me, um, what led you in July of 1980 to uh, leave uh, this is this, uh, you know, assistant directorship. Uh, basically, I guess I got made an offer I couldn't, could not very well resist. Uh, the people that were involved with the EPA efforts at Three Mile Island uh, came to North Carolina and uh, twisted my arm and asked me if I would come up and they they discovered that they weren't going to get away with what they originally thought they were going to have. Uh, maybe a presence for 30 or 45 days, something like that, and they, and they all could go back to, to Las Vegas. Uh, why they were here in the first place is a whole other story. The people from Montgomery should have been here, but that's, that's another story. That always amazed me that the wrong people came. At, well, there, the was, there was a new organization in EPA. They didn't know what the radiation response plan was, and uh, the administrator asked the deputy administrator, hey, don't you have a radiation outfit in Las Vegas, and the next thing you know, the Las Vegas people were flying in. Whereas the people in Montgomery had uh, mobile vans and everything ready to roll up here. Yeah, I, I was expecting the Montgomery yeah. people here, they, and they never came from what I know. That, that, that caused a fair, <laughs> fair amount of grief over the years, but anyhow, when I found out it wasn't going to work 45 days, and they were starting to have problem, marital problems amongst the people they were assigning out here, they decided to make it into a quote unquote permanent station. And I was asked to come up and, and run it, and my choice was sort of do I sit there in North Carolina doing administrative work for other people doing research, and I'm not going to be doing anything involving radiation for which I'm trained, or do I come up to Pennsylvania and do something, you know, that's in definitely radiation related? I had Probably some uh, 
misconceptions and how much good I'd be able to do. You know, I had this thought of a Pennsylvania native being able to get on a white horse and roll right in and perhaps uh, put oil on the troubled waters and things like that. Didn't, didn't really work that way too well. That's, that's what led me to, to come up here. Also, I had two daughters in college at Penn State. Uh, my in-laws were at the Philadelphia end of the pike. My parents were at the you Pittsburgh end of the pike. You have some pictures of these children, by the way? Oh, yeah, I have some here. You, you remember them now, if I can find them. Uh, children, where'd they go? Kids, kids, kids. Uh, yeah, this is an early on picture. This was far beyond that period of time, or earlier. How much earlier? Oh. It says 1969 on the back. 69, so that had been 11 years earlier. The, old, the, the two girls were at Penn State and the uh, boy was in seventh grade. Uh, one of the other motivations of coming up here is uh, he was in a school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Your son? My son, and uh, he was taking his, you know, the achievement tests, and he was getting 95th percentile in everything but English, and it was 30th percentile in English, and it turns out that the teacher would send these things home marked up with an A or a B, and I could find 15 mistakes without even looking. So I decided he was going to have to go to a private school or we're going to have to move, so we came up here. Talked to the school system up here. He repeated seventh, seventh grade, taking AP projects, and they gave him the worst uh, or the toughest English teacher they had in the system in Hershey. And it wound up, surprisingly enough, when he ultimately graduated from the Naval Academy in 1990, his major was English. Hmm. Which I thought, of course, a degree from the Naval Academy is a degree in engineering with a subset of whatever else you might call it. But anyhow. Um, our short little stay here in Pennsylvania. Actually, I thought I'd be here maybe two years. I was planning on retiring. And you're here, what, eight years? Uh, well, I was there eight years at the Public Health Service. I've been here ever since, but uh, I thought this deal will be done in a couple of years and I'll retire. I thought I was going to get a job at the medical center and doing radiation biology. Well, well, well I remember, let, let, let's stop for a minute here because I remember very well that uh, it was maybe a a year into the TMI accident, when the only thing we had left in containment was Krypton 85. Yeah. And I also remember thinking, well, thank God we have somebody who knows how to measure Krypton 85 in the EPA, because that's what Bill Kirk did all his early PhD work on mm -hmm. was Krypton 85. Right. And I remember all those papers you gave at the Noble Gas mm -hmm. Symposium, learning about absorption of Krypton into, into fat cells and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You really educated the heck out of the whole health physics community back then about that. Now. Uh, tell me about your involvement in the measurement, because we had to have environmental measurements of Krypton-85, and it's not easy to measure. Well, the quirky part about that is I didn't get here until the day they finished the uh, venting of the containment. But they were doing Krypton-85 measurements by... Uh, Good old EPA timing, huh? Uh, yeah, uh, by, <laughs> use, by taking um, compressed air samples, basically, but measured volume of compressed air and then doing uh, cryogenic distillation of the krypton out of it, and then using liquid scintillation to count the you know count the krypton. It's a very, very uh, interesting method. Actually, there's two subsets of it. One of which had been developed in Montgomery, and one of which was developed in the lab in Las Vegas. We were using the Las Vegas method, but that's. I had a uh, uh, lady that came to work for me. That was, she was there when I got there, actually, by the name of Charlie Smalls, who. Uh, wasn't a health physicist. She, her degree was in developmental biology, but she wound up started doing uh, monitoring work, and then they brought her into the laboratory, and she wound up running our laboratory. Learned all the stuff from the uh, EPA people in Las Vegas. But she's one of the few people I've ever met that was able to master that witchy technique of cryogenic distillation of krypton, and she did that for us for the last several years we were there. But there was not that much krypton released. That it, that's right. Well, you were one of the few people that could measure it. I mean, yeah. everybody else was measuring zeros. And it was nice to have somebody that could actually measure the levels that, that were being released. Well, the people from Penn State did it by a different method. They, they had a stainless steel high-pressure marinelli that they pumped gas into and then measured it on a, a high-sensitive crystal, high crystal. And they were able to get some measurements, which agreed generally with our measurements. 
side on that, some years later I was asked to get down to uh, Savannah River to make some argon measurements down there. They were doing some work around one of the reactors at uh, Savannah River. And I borrowed Bill Jester's system to take down there and do that. And allegedly the tanks had been purged. Uh, I didn't have time to purge them. I was sent down there very quickly. And it turns out about half our samples were contaminated with krypton from 380 <laughs> from uh, TMI because they hadn't been purged adequately. <laughs> to purge those tanks, you have to pressurize them and put them under vacuum three or four times to get and down. You didn't there. have Tom Jaruski's permission to move it out of the state, huh? <laughs> I could have gotten in trouble that way. There was measurable amounts of krypton in those damn tanks. <laughs> but uh, the argon came off all right. We were able to see the argon, the krypton. They wanted to check on that. Those didn't work very well. But um, we were there through uh, the whole major part of the decommissioning up to the point that the fuel was pretty well gone. And I also might add that uh, your office was extremely helpful in pulling together all of the thousands upon thousands of environmental samples mm. that had been uh, sent out to, to, uh, uh, to be put on machine uh, in, in Las Vegas. And if you remember, there were you know literally hundreds of errors that had to be corrected. Which your your associate John Sykes yeah. but the thing tracked is, down and thank God we had you all to do it. In other words, that had to be a mechanism to do this, and the mechanism wow. was to give it to you, and you got it done. Because when we worked directly with with Las Vegas, it never seemed to work very well. But doing it through you, it, it happened. Now, it I don't know what always, you did. It didn't always work that well. It was one we, for a long time we were entering data on a remote terminal in, in Middletown. It was going on to the EPA computer at Las Vegas. Then it was transferred to a big uh, DOE computer. Uh, the problem is there's only so much memory in the, in the one in Las Vegas, and there was at least one occasion where a month of data we put in got pushed out the other end, and we had to re-enter an entire month of data. Mm. And uh, we could only get in there between uh, 3 and 9 p.m. our time, because that was when the computer was available. We eventually got our own computer and were able to do it better. Well, anyway, that we had a lot of public meetings. How many public meetings? I don't know. I figured one time I went to about 200 public meetings of one kind or another, basically. Well, I guess they started out, I got here after the meetings concerning the pre work on the Krypton venting. But then they had a uh, oh, uh, uh, environmental impact statement draft that had to be explained to a whole bunch of people. We went around and the state people and the federal people and you know, EPA and DOE and NRC, uh, Maggie Riley and Tom Jaruski, I don't remember who all else from the state went, uh, but uh, I can remember one down in, uh, in Lancaster where we went down with uh, state police escort. The cars were guarded in uh, outside the uh, place and there were police lined all the way around the uh, you know the auditorium there were several hundred people there the mayor of uh, Lancaster uh, was you know running the meeting stay well, peaceful there were a lot of charged atmosphere meetings I remember those very well uh, mm -hmm. let's let's move on here you um, after after 88 uh, you worked um, with uh, what EPA and ADSTAR through about uh, 94, 96? Mm -hmm. no. I left EPA when I retired from Public Health Service in 88. At that point in time, the Hershey Medical Center took over the monitoring program on a, on a uh, contract. And the state was paying part and, and EPA was paying part. I, had, I think the first year EPA paid the whole thing, the second year they paid half, and after that the state was caught with it. It decreased down for a while. They were doing this tritium. There was a lot of interest in tritium being released from the uh, containment during the cleanup. And well, that's the thing that was left, of course, with tritium in the water. Yeah, we were able to, to easily detect tritium at the, at the uh, uh, observation center. It worked pretty well. I remember we also found it under the BWST pretty easily. Too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What so was it places on site at TMI, it was uh, easy to find a couple, couple million uh, picocuries per liter underneath that tank. <laughs> right, yeah. That's Mother Nature at work. Frost broke a line. <laughs> yeah. uh, 10,000 gallons or so went into the ground. 
which is actually a small amount compared to the amount that oh, yeah. have been generated. But but in any case, um, tell me tell me about your about your work. Uh, well, when I left the, when I left EPA, I went to work for a company called Radiation Physics Incorporated, which is a privately held company. I don't know who all owns it. I know Ken Miller here at the medical center is one of the partners, and Lou Rubin. Their principal function in life had been uh, providing mobile x-ray services to uh, nursing homes and things like that, but they had expanded. They were doing some environmental work at the time. Got involved with doing some samples from up here from, from companies, not from the government. And uh, that was about the time the radon issue was hitting the fan. They decided that we can't go into the radon, radon measurement business, and which we did, and we spent about two years uh, working on it. In fact, there's a picture of me in one of our laboratories. Holding a Lucas cell. Holding a Lucas cell. Which connected to a pylon detector, I believe. Yeah. That one. We had, uh, uh, we're certified to use six or seven different methods for measuring krypton. This was not that difficult radon. to do. Or radon, excuse me. Oops. Oh, well, they're both noble gases. Uh, but, but anyway, any, any, the radon uh, that you were mostly measuring. We were measuring radon. And, uh, and well, what made you go to work for the state? We weren't making enough money to support me. That's an awfully good reason to go to work for the state. And actually, uh, Tom Jaruski had talked with me some years previously about coming up there. And I, at that point, I was about fed up with governments. My three years with RPI, I was about mm -hmm. fed up with other things. So. I uh, went up there and uh, thought I was going to have a nice long spell working with Tom that I had known for a long time. Well, I always respected had a good staff. And, I always uh, liked his staff. I got there, the uh, thing was set up, I think, uh, in early December. Tom retired the end of December and I came in January the following year. So I never did get a chance to work with him up there. But uh, I did a, a number of different things there, you know. Uh, Environmental surveillance is what I remember. Environmental surveillance, I helped with some of the stuff with the Krypton. I got the Krypton grant uh, working fairly decently before it went over. The people that were in radon had never done any of that, uh, that sort of work. Now you and I worked on a project called Queen Hannah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Because you must remember. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you must remember that. Well. Uh, <laughs> When Maggie Riley, let me step back a notch. Maggie Riley, who had been in charge of the environmental and emergency response uh, issues in the Bureau, retired in uh, 1990, end of 94, and I got stuck in to replace her until they reorganized the Bureau and that division went away altogether. But anyhow, uh, Maggie had been the uh, Bureau of Radiation Protection contact for the cleanup of the uh, facility at Quihanna. Now that was up in Clearfield County, out in the middle of nowhere. It's about five miles from the nearest human being. You're more likely to hit a deer than see a human being, most areas out there. Uh, it had been built in the late 50s. Uh, late 50s or six. Yeah, late 50s. I'm trying to remember exactly. Anyhow, it was built. Bill Martin Nuclear Division. Yeah. Uh, initially, it was built to do research work for the Department of Energy, uh, having to do with the development of nuclear power aircraft and a couple other things. They built it, and they were testing uh, reactors and testing fuel in their main facility, which had a at that had a swimming pool reactor in it. They did different tests. They had some hot cells, six hot cells, where they could handle the highly radioactive material. And uh, this went on for maybe five years or so, and then they they bailed out. Uh, gave so control of the gave hmm? Arco, right? Uh, mm, yeah, sort of. It went to. Uh, Control of it went to Penn State, running running the thing, and then um, Martin Marietta came in to uh, 
use the facility for the hot cell facilities for making the uh, radioisotope heat generators, the SNAP, uh, snap reactors, snap generators. generators for powering things like um, oh, ocean going buoys, remote uh, weather stations, things of this nature. They were made uh, using uh, strontium 90 as the isotope. They would get the isotope in in a big cask from Hanford containing some millions of curies, I believe, at the time. Uh, their licensing was for five or ten thousand curies. Or was it millions of curies? Millions of curies, millions. excuse me. But they brought it in there and ran it through a system that they devised and converted it to uh, strontium titanate and pe pelletized the stuff and put it into Highly the... Highly insoluble. And, which is, well, you know, almost not soluble. But in the process of doing that, they, they worked until 1967. From 60 to 67. Uh, they left. There was a several surveys done. Allegedly, the place had been had been cleaned up, uh, and it was, I think you could say, cleaned up to the standards of the time for an existing, continuing running uh, radiation facility. The standards that we have today had not been conceived of as far as being, you know, clean enough to eat your dinner off the floor without getting any radioactivity in the process. Uh, they were replaced by Arco, uh, Numac, who were using the. They took the the reactor was taken out of the swimming pool, and a big uh, cobalt sixty irradiator put in. And they did all sorts of experiments with high-level uh, gamma radiation there, including uh, dosimetry and food irradiation and wood. And, uh, they ultimately developed a process for making uh, flooring using wood that had been impregnated with uh, methyl methacrylate plastic under pressure, and then irradiated with a couple hundred thousand rads of cobalt uh, radiation. You got a material that would last. 50 years or so, people walking on it, you beat on it with a hammer, it's not going to damp things like that. It was very handy. They decided to close up. They being Arco. Arco. Wait, I, I've got my number, my dates wrong. <coughs> Martin Marietta left in 1960. Arco came in in 19... I didn't get that right yet. 67. <coughs> I can't read it. I wrote a paper on this about two years ago. He says Curtis was Curtis Wright. Curtis, Curtis Wright was the original. From Curtis Wright to Martin Marietta. From Martin Marietta to Arco Numac. And when Arco Numac left in 67, then the company called uh, Permagrain Products was formed by employees of Arco Numac, which took over the wood process and have been there ever since making, making flooring. Uh, Long about uh, the late 80s, the NRC got onto this kick of getting things that weren't being actively used cleaned up. The hot cells there were not being used, so they wanted them decommissioned. The state got involved with it at that point. Well, the state had been involved with it all the way back to 67 when we got title to it. I'm sure uh, Tom Jaruski will have a lot to say about that, but uh, at any rate, we had to do a cleanup of this place, and uh, we found out to our dismay that it wasn't nearly as cleaned up as it had been led to believe. We had a, a preliminary survey done which found uh, gamma dose rates in a hot cell of four or five hundred R per hour from cobalt-60. There was beta dose rates that we measured that were at that point that were something of the order of a couple, three rem per hour. Um, we went through that, uh, the whole contracting business and hired a contractor to go in there and clean up uh, an outfit that's now NES Scientech. Uh, it was NES at the time. I uh, got the contract and they went in. We, they did a lot of cleaning up, a couple thousand curies of, of, uh, of cobalt-60 and various pellets, rods, Microspheres was were removed from one or two hot cells entirely remotely, 
done by people using the uh, remote handling devices. Sort of amazing that nobody seemed to quite know these existed, and then all of a sudden they turned. Some off. some of the things weren't on the inventory yeah. that we they were They weren't on any inventory known to mankind, but sadly the state ended up paying for those. That, uh, that those were were taken away. All that stuff was taken away and taken down to uh, South Carolina and disposed of, and. Uh, we went on with the cleanup of most of the rest of the contamination with strontium-90, and we continued with the cleanup on that. And uh, one part of the facility where they had done most of the hottest strontium work had a, it's a sort of a, a cell within a cell. They had a, uh, a process cell within a hot cell, within a hot, hot, cell. Cell. <laughs> a hot cell within a hot cell. And uh, it turned out to be, it was more highly contaminated than thought. But we were going ahead and working on it, and uh, first, first we had a little problem with uh, we cut loose a piece of uh, piece of tubing, managed to spread uh, something like a, I think the estimate was a hundred millicuries or so of strontium in the high bay area, and that had to be all cleaned up. But then it caused a substantial delay, a lot of fuss locally, a lot of TV coverage. Uh, a lot of political hassle. But as we went on with that particular hot cell, they got down inside it from above. It had to be entered from above. There was no direct entry. Uh, they were down there taking things out, measuring, doing surveys, and happened to pass a meter across one disconnected tube when they took the cap off it. Quarter inch tube, by the way. Yeah. Quarter inch stainless steel tube. The, Small the tube. The measurement was roughly between 40 and 50,000 rad per hour uh, beta. And this is where people are, too. And this is where people this were going to be. This is not the highest work. number. This is where uh, a number of an occupied number. Yeah. Well, this was, in the, this was in that cell where they'd have to be working. They'd, they'd have had triple. But they were in there. Triple levels of decon clothing. But at this point, it was decided that to finish this up, it'd have to be done remotely uh, with using uh, Robots. Yeah. Well, the potential for having airborne material was very no, small. It was very high. It, it was not low-level potential. At all. That uh, that strontium ninety bounced around like fuel fleas. I think was your your word for it. But that project is still ongoing. It's probably in terms of radioactivity removed. Ninety-five percent plus is removed. We know of something between maybe uh, estimated a hundred plus or minus curies of strontium in various parts of that. Uh, that uh, process box that have to be moved, have to be taken out. But when, when it seems to me when the state took over the, the whole license, they had no idea that that, that, that mm -hmm. even existed. No. And they were told that, the place that, had been cleaned up to where, yeah. uh, to where they didn't have to worry about any kind of... Supposedly uh, the whole system had been flushed uh, out and all the bad stuff was gone. And so th this all came as a great surprise to the, mm -hmm. to the state. It was, it was interesting though that um, when the state went back to some of the previous folks, they discovered a, uh, a contract that, that Martin Marietta had had with the government that essentially said the government would take care of paying for any cleanup that they got held responsible for. So, allegedly, uh, we are going to collect some of that, uh, the best part of that money from the Department of Energy someday. What these latest uh, terrorist issues may have done to that, I don't know. Well, Bill, you um, you retired uh, recently from uh, mm -hmm. the Pennsylvania State Bureau of Radiological Health. Uh, how recent was that? July. Okay, so it's last year. So, so you are a new retiree. New retiree, and my wife's keeping me extremely busy between. We spent the last five months out in Pittsburgh while she was recuperating from a broken leg, and now I have her home. But uh, I'm glad to she can't she can't uh, can't do anything uh, much, so I'm doing all the. Now I think you have a picture of your work. grandchildren here. You might show um, a number of grandchildren. Yeah. You, have a, you have a very productive uh, family well, here. Three kids, six grandkids. Oh yeah, <laughs> this was taken at the beach summer before last. That's the. That's the six of them.
And you might want to show that one picture of your whole family. He certainly has a large family now that he's the well, senior member this, of. This was the whole group taking it. Several Christmases ago, there's two grandchildren missing from that one. They hadn't been born yet. So you've been a very productive man, health physics-wise as well as family-wise. Well, had, uh, you know, three children that married and had children, six grandchildren. It's, it's one of them has one, one of them has two, and my son has three, all girls. He's a naval officer, lieutenant commander in the Navy. He's up at the uh, War College right now. And he says when he, he hopes that he has a ship command or a, something when these girls get to be teenagers because he'll be living in estrogen in hell. And he, and he, wants, he wants to be able to go away. <laughs> I think that, prob that comment probably ought to be cut before my daughter-in-law can see it. Although she's heard that statement many times. <laughs> well, Bill, um, it certainly has been a pleasure for me to be a colleague of yours for all these years, and I've, I've very much uh, have, have enjoyed interviewing you. And I think that you've uh, given an awful lot to the profession over the years. Uh, by the way, Bill's, uh, the number of publications he has is in the hundreds. And, no, no, and no, no, no. well, publications plus talks. Yeah, you have to add talks. Uh, uh, and you're a very, very productive person with, with, within the profession. And the History Committee is very pleased to have this uh, tape. And hopefully we thank won't you. chew it up too much, edit it too much, because uh, it should be fun the way it is. Okay. So thank you very much. You're welcome. You know, my grandfather used to say so what the incredible stress was. Well, you know, that's, you know, everybody got, got major settlements uh, for uh, health-related 